Hey, Mr. Pondboss, tell me how. Hey, Mr. Pondboss, let's do it now. Hey, Mr. Pondboss, you're the one that makes fishing so much fun. Well, I woke up this morning and I headed for my pond. Meet Mr. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk, the Pond Boss. Hey, it must be Wednesday, and we're live on this Wednesday, June the 20th. Welcome, everybody. I see Jason Nebstad checking in with us. Man, have I got a cool show lined up for you guys tonight. You're going to have a whole lot of fun. Going to have Sean McNulty check in from American Sport Fish Hatchery. As a matter of fact, that was over there at his place yesterday, and uh, there's a very cool video up that, uh, that we shot over there that showed you some of the fish and how they do what they do. I see John Fitzgerald, Fred Bingham, and Tory Rhodes, Chris, Chris Abrell. Hey, man, Leo checking in from uh, the left coast. Very cool. So uh, let's get this thing rolling. Now, just you guys know the rules or what we want. There's really no rules. We're just going to play tonight and have a little bit of fun. But, but, be able, please be uh, sure and click like. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. There you go. Jason's on it. He's got it. Hey, Brian Lawrence. So uh, be sure to share this video to your newsfeed because we want to get the word out. We really want to get more subscribers to Pond Boss. And here we go. We got 19 folks on board so far. And I told, uh, I asked, uh, I see Daniel McCorder. Hey, he's, he's in. Good, 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 good. We got some guys, Troy Todd checking in. So, hey, you know the deal. And, and I really appreciate you guys that have recently subscribed to Pond Boss. Mike Cottrell waving at us. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, 35 bucks a year. 35 bucks a year. Now, I haven't seen my wife. I've been on a road trip. Matter of fact, I've been to, uh, good gosh, I started off, left here, went to uh, Austin, Texas, did a live radio show, then from there to Houston to see grandkids, and then from there to Beaumont to put a few fish in a lake. And on the Facebook page, you can see what we did with some of those fish. John Funk, John Fitzgerald, good. You guys are sharing this thing. Good. That's what I want you to do. Share it. The more we already got four shares. I want 40 shares tonight, guys. Come on, 40 shares. Every every Facebook page that you know that can use this, do it. Uh, 35 bucks. Debbie and I are going to go to dinner Friday night, and we will spend over 40 bucks, I promise. So 35 bucks for a subscription to this magazine that is top of the line. There's Nicole. Hey, guess what? I spent the night in Hammond, Louisiana the other night. Yeah, Leo says, let the genetics lesson begin. Yeah, it's going to begin. 35 bucks for a year's worth of nuggets that you're not going to find anywhere else. I promise you, you can spend all day long you want on University of Google, and you ain't going to find everything that you find here. There's Steve Lewis. Hey, Steve. Steve, this could be fun for you, man, because... Uh, I know the, the amount of your life that you've dedicated to raising pure strain Florida bass there around Hot Springs, Arkansas, you're going to want to hear what Sean McNulty has to say. So in a minute, Sean will uh, click in here, which I'm ready for you there, Sean. If you're watching, I know you are. But if you will uh, put a comment in the comments section, I will invite you to join us, and we're going to start talking about what you guys are doing. You know, pondboss.com is a great resource. You, uh, Yeah, Nicole, well... We weren't sure we were going to stay in Hammond. We were hoping to kind of get to Jackson, Mississippi, but we just found us a hotel room. Next time we come through, my little granddaughter, Gentry, she learned a little bit about Boudin, and she loved it. I love Cracklins. Of course, we go to Billy's Boudin right there along Interstate 10 just so we can do the drive through which ain't quite the same thing. Looking like, hey, there's Timothy Phillips and Lydia, Lydia North, Mike Rivers. Mike's on early tonight. He must not be fishing. Hey, there's Sean. I'm going to invite Sean right now. Let's see if I can do this. Invite Sean. Let's see here. I'm going to have to do it on my phone, looks like here. Okay, Sean, I'm going to bring Sean on camera. Now, all you got to do is accept it, and you're going to be on camera, and we're going to be able to talk. Just accept that invitation. Looks like uh, Jim Liner. Hey, Jim, it was fun spending time with you, man. Frank James is checking in from Houghton, Louisiana. Good to see you. Yes, sir. All right. So, Sean, all you got to do is accept that invitation. That will bring you on the camera live, and then we can start talking. I spent some time with Sean there at American Sport Fish, and they've got hundreds of acres of ponds. And part of what their specialty is is feed train largemouth bass, but they also do a whole lot 
of really cool stuff to uh, to 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 create some of the most genetically superior largemouth bass that you're going to come across. Clint Love Day, see you there, buddy. How are you? Let's see. Um, Buffy Boudreaux Smith just stocked 122 inch American sport fish tiger bass two weeks ago. Got a new one acre pond that's brimming with fat ed minnows and copper nose bluegill. Jay Wesley Carter, howdy. Ty Lusk is checking in from uh, Arizona. There's Mark Dauber. Breakfast with Mark yesterday, I know. Yeah, yeah, yesterday. Sure did. Hey, Mark, good to see you, man. Mark is a longtime friend and a great friend of Ray Scott's, and we got to spend a little bit of time. So, uh, Let's see here. Now my laptop's kind of messing up. There's Jacob West. So, trying to get Sean on here with us so we can talk about some stuff. Be sure and check out the video that I put up. So, in the meantime, we got a few questions that have already come online to talk to Sean about. We're going to, Frank James asked from Facebook, he said, How do tiger bass compare with Florida bass for growth and catchability? Do tiger bass stay feed trained when they're put in a pond with a feeder? And if so, what kind of feed is recommended? And Tory Rhodes, and see, and also Frank asked, do tiger males get bigger than the Florida males? Tory Rhodes says, not sure what your talking subjects are, but if you have time, will you ask how often a second stocking of tiger bass be introduced to keep the hybrid vigor or how back crosses come into play? And then from the Palm Boss Forum, we've had a number of questions. Discuss how big pellet-fed bass will grow up. Their diet is primarily good quality, high-protein pellets. So, Sean, the phone is blocking. Can we try again? You bet. We're going to try it again right now, Sean. Let's uh, bring Sean in you. You just need to accept it. Hey, Jeff from Wisconsin. Good to see you. Dion Parker. Chris Aguilar. All right. There we go. I hear you. There you are. You're sideways. Turn, turn your phone the other way. <laughs> there you are. That was harder than I expected. <laughs> man, I'm How good. How you doing, man? I'm good. I, All right. I cool. Up, I, well, welcome. Uh, Texas actually let me get home early today, so... Yeah, we, we had to cancel all those runs out there, so... Uh, we. So. Yeah. Yeah, you were supposed to be bringing some fish where I was going to meet you in the morning, but 12 inches of rain kind of throws a damper on The fish on that, don't mind it, but the heavy trucks do. Yeah, yeah, when you're trying to drive through uh, flood waters to get to a muddy pond bank, kind of makes sense to right. back it off. Got it. All right, let's see. Uh, we got a whole bunch of, looks like some folks that you're bringing on board. Glad to see that. We got Buffy Boudreaux Smith. He says uh, he's got a question. So I tell you what, let's do. Let's take a few minutes and start tackling some of these questions. Frank James, who is a regular on the Pond Boss Forum and on the Facebook page, has bought some tiger okay. bass from you. And he says his first question is, um, how do tiger bass compare with Florida bass for growth and catchability? But you know what? Before we do that, why don't you take a couple of minutes, Sean, and tell people who you are, what you do, okay. and how you do it. Um, I'm Sean McNulty. I'm with American Sport Fish Hatchery out of Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, American Sport Fish has been producing fish uh, since about 1985. Uh, about six years ago, uh, me and two of my partners, we bought out Don and Barry. And since then, we've just, we've continued their tradition of the tiger bass and have expanded into a lot more pond management. And, you know, that's why we came out to meet you out at the Pond Boss Conference a few years ago. And, you know, just... See what's going on out there in Texas and how y'all are doing things. That's good. Well, you know, your the predecessors, uh, Don Keller and Barry Smith, both those guys are fisheries biologists that had worked for agencies before, and they're the guys that came up with the idea on how to how to create the F1 Tiger Bass and actually right. trademark the name. So even though even though we're going to talk about that a whole lot tonight, but and you guys kind of hang your hat on those F1 tiger bass, but that's not the only fish you guys yep. raise. So you guys are really zeroed in on stocking ponds, but tell the folks more about the different species of fish that you raise. And then let's, let's segue from that into some of the pond management things that you guys do over there. Okay, in the South sure. East. So we raise just about every fish except for smallmouth bass. We're going to ignore any smallmouth bass questions because we always get a whole bunch of requests, but we raise, you know, copper nose bluegill, Red ears, uh, the Florida strain of bass, northern strain, obviously the tiger bass, 
We raise crappie, golden shiners, fathead minnows, threadfin shad, and grass carp. So just about any need for stocking go. ponds, recreational ponds, or reservoirs. That's that's what we do. Got it. Excellent. Looks like Dion Parker's checking in. Looks like old Buffy Boudreaux Smith is using his wife's Facebook page. Kevin Smith from Zachary. There we go. Okay. Well, I won't go say anything, but I'm glad he did. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Kevin Briggs, he's a regular. He's on board. Um, you know what? Let's just take, let's, okay, so now, there's a little bit about the fish that you raised. Now, of course, you guys, if you really want to just kind of get a primer into what these guys do to feed train their fish, come back to the Pond Boss Facebook page after this broadcast and look at the video that we put up yesterday. Sean took us around through one of their rat sheds and showed us how they feed train their fish and we got to see a few bass live. We didn't pick any up. I don't want to bother them, you know, let them do what they do. So, but there's a little primer or a little primer right there where he tells you about how they train fish to eat fish food. We're going to talk about that some more. The, uh, there's Michael Gray checking in from Nashville, Tennessee, one of the premier pond builders in the nation. Let's see. I tell you what, let's go ahead and tackle some of these. Oh, no, no, no. Let's back up. Some of the pond management things that you do, tell the folks what you do with, with the pond management side of the business. And then kind of go into the dredging side, what you guys okay. do. Okay. Uh, since we uh, bought American Sport Fish, we have three main divisions. We have a fish farm, we have pond management, and then construction. And inside the construction is the dredging aspect of what we do. In the pond management, we have biologists that stay on the road. And we manage ponds from Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, Arkansas, all over the southeast. I think we're right about a thousand, uh, 3,000 acres of ponds that we manage. And that typically involves going out once a month. We apply fertilizer, uh, any herbicides that's needed to make sure that the vegetation doesn't get out of control, filling feeders. You know, obviously we electrofish uh, to follow the populations, um, you know, follow water quality and make sure that when the guy shows up on the weekend, all he has to do is fish and enjoy the lake and not have to work. In. So that main goal. There you go. The pond management. Excellent. Excellent. And then you guys have a construction side. You know, I, I don't know much about the pond construction side of what you guys do, but I know that you guys have several crews that spend time working on older lakes and ponds that need some silt and things removed. Just, just touch on that briefly, and then we'll send them to uh, americansportfish.com to sure. find that board. So we have uh, two floating dredges, about 30 foot long, and we can we move them around just with a flatbed trailer so we can get in and out very easily. Uh, there's not a lot of setup or disturbing the area. I mean, we've dropped in to busy subdivisions where there's not a whole lot of space, and, you know, we can remove a lot of sediment that comes in on the mouth, and you see this all the time as the sediment builds up, cattails start growing, weeds start growing, and it's just an eyesore. It also takes away from a lot of the healthy spawning areas that a lot of your fish use. And so, you know, you have two options. Get it out, you can drain your pond, kill all your fish, and then excavate it out, but that is a mess. You know, you lose time, you lose your fish. So with the hydraulic dredging, we can come in, uh, drop the boat in. It's got an auger on it that'll chew up the sediment, and we can pump it up to 1,800 feet, uh, into geo bags or open discharge or really just whatever we need to do to get the job done. I mean, so what you kind of do is you go in there and evaluate what needs to be done, sit down with the landowner, figure out what the goals and the missions are, set a That's budget right. and go at you know. it. Okay. So you cover a bunch of bases. Let's tackle some of these questions because this everybody's so excited. You're on I don't here. Know this if is going to go fast. So let's hit some of these. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Let's uh, since Frank James is watching, even if he wasn't, we're gonna do this anyway. His question is, how do tiger bass compare with pure spring Florida bass for growth and catchability? You know, catchability is really the driving force behind the tiger bass, in my opinion, because you know we all know Florida bass get large, you know, but it's amazing, you know, you can tell people that Florida bass are harder to catch in most lakes. But you can see it even when we're feed training Florida bass, you know, or feeding our brooders. They have a whole different feeding behavior. You know, you can take a goldfish or a crawfish or anything, 
and throw it in a tank full of northern bass, and that fish probably won't get wet. They will eat it before it even hits the water. But with a Florida bass, you throw it in there, and they all kind of stare at it, look at it, and then they go after it. So the, the tiger bass is just more aggressive than, than the Florida bass. And size-wise, you know, that's the big question. We don't know the maximum of the tiger bass. We've seen uh, 15 pounders, which is not a bad fish. Um, but that's the biggest we've seen. Uh, so we don't really know what the top end is uh, at this point. And we obviously know that Florida's the pit, um, the one in Japan at 22 pounds and the one out in California. So we know, we know Florida's can get to that size. So they, they might have a little advantage there, but I'm not sure that the tiger bass won't catch it in the right circumstance. So, so, so in other words, what, what I just heard you say is, is maybe a bass with the genetic propensity to hit 15 pounds also has the propensity to hit 20. If That's it has right. The you know, it, you can put, you can put the perfect knows. bass in a terrible pond, and it's not going to do anything, and vice versa. So, you know, you got a lot of different Bingo. things lined up to even talk about double-digit bass, much less 15, 16, 17 pounders. You know, that you – Yeah, if, yeah. If, if LeBron James only had lettuce to eat from <laughs> zero to 10 years old, he wouldn't be playing in, in the NBA, would he? He wouldn't be seven foot something to be some – magnanimous star because he just didn't get what he needed when he was that's young right. he did you know so i don't know if that's i don't know if that's a great analogy or not by the way one, i'm gonna stop real quick uh if if you if you hashtag pond boss magazine click like and share this video you're eligible for a drawing for hey look at this a pond boss hat and a mug and some other goodies we got you know our resource guide we've got a uh a little brochure on how to feed fish. Last week's winner is Clayton Bounds. So congratulations, Clayton. You're going to be getting your stuff in the mail if we have your address. If we don't have your address, send it to us. Next question. Do tiger bass stay feed trained when they're put into a pond with a feeder? If so, what kind of feed do you sure. recommend? Uh, a lot of it, in my opinion, depends on how big that bass is when you put it in. You know, we feed train two-inch bass. But I think one that's, you know, six, seven, eight inches is going to more likely to stay on feed once it goes on than a smaller fish. But okay. in, in a pond full of forage, at our hatchery, we put them out at three inches, and that's how we grow them. So they'll definitely stay on feed in a pond. Um, but I, but at, the hatchery, you're, at the hatchery, you're putting how many, in, how many per acre when you're stocking them in at, at three inches from the Up to about 10,000 per acre. Okay, so if you stock 10,000 breakers, you're going to stay on <laughs> feed, right? But, you know, but, <laughs> but, in a sport, but in a sport fish pond, you know, one thing, Sean, you ought to talk about is is a bass's instinct is to be a predator, and you can't condition that out. Absolutely. Right? So if, you, if, if somebody has a pond and they stock, say, 200 F1 tiger bass per acre on, on the top of uh, bluegill that have been stocked in for a few months and fathead minnows. What, what percentage of those fish do you think will come to a feeder? You know, in a if you have to say you have three feeders in a 10 acre lake, how many of those bass will find? The I think a lot of them will if you have the right feed in there because they smell it and it's an easy meal. You know, they are predators, but they also there's so much competition in that lake, they want to get as big as, as big as they can, as fast as they can putting out as little energy as they can and a floating pellet is pretty easy. So, you know, if you've got the feeder going off all the time and you've got a high protein diet like the Purina Aquamax, then, you know, we see a lot of them stay on feed. It's not their only source. They're not sitting at that feeder all day long, just waiting on that. But just like the bluegill, they're eating other things on and when they can get a quick, easy meal, they'll take advantage of it. So I don't have a good feel to say what percentage, but I know we probably stock more large feed train bass in your lakes than any place we have this way. So, and I know almost all of your ponds, the bass are staying on feed. Yeah. Yeah. They do a good job of that. You know, let, let's talk about that because I think something that nobody's going to, I mean, there's, they're not going to get this information anywhere else. If let's, let's say we've got a, a five acre lake, Matter of fact, you know what? You're getting ready to stock a six-acre lake in southeast Texas when the floods go down, and we're stocking 200 
three inch or so F1 tiger bass into that lake on top of 200 pounds of fathead minnows. And for this guy, he's in a hurry. So we're stocking 20,000 <laughs> copper nose bluegill fingerlings with shell crackers right. in there. So the competition is going to be pretty intense. The feeding program I'm going to have him do is he's going to be feeding Purina Aquamax MVP, which he's doing now to feed the fathead minnows. But I'm thinking I'm going to tell him to have that feeder go off about eight times a day. You know, early on, like in 30-minute intervals for the first four. So just to present that feed more often. you think that's a smart thing to do? In a new I think absolutely, because as soon as those fish come in there, they're going to figure out where the easiest food is. You know, especially if you've got structure around those feeders where the smaller fish can hang out waiting for that feeder to go off. I think absolutely. Pour the feed to them, get them used to it, and I think they'll stay there. They'll stay on the feed. So. I know when you're uh, when you and I were talking yesterday and on this video, you feed a really high protein salmonid feed made by scredding that you enhance with fish meal that you also add fish oil to to make it more palatable and smell better. So you're really trying to entice the, your young bass. By, by attacking all their senses, not only their instinct to hit, but the way that they can smell the feed and their other sensory perceptions, so you can at least get them on that feed. So, you know, there's is so just kind of generically, we're talking about Aquamax MVP, but what if you were really if you're one of these guys out here that has a pond that wants to grow some bigger fish, what kind of feed do you want to feed the fish? Just describe. Oh, that. really? Uh I think the Aquamax, especially, and I can't remember if that's the MVP that has the different sizes in there to where you can hit different size fish at one feeding. You know, the size of the pellet that you're giving can really drive or hamper your bass growth. Because what we see in the hatchery is that you need to push them to the biggest feed possible as soon as possible. That way they're using you know, X amount of energy to get more calories out of that feed. So, you know, you need to make sure your pellet's big enough to feed the bass that you have in there, but also you gotta make sure if you're really putting it, you want the bluegill eating there too, because the fatter and healthier they are, that's gonna move up the food chain into the your So, you know, I, I, Aquamax has a really good line. They've got different sizes so that you can transition, you know, from just get started, you know, they also have sizes where you can mix or where they're pre-mixed. I think, I, I think I'll, the Perina brand's a, it's a good line. Okay, excellent. And, you know, I think the key, the key point you're making here is be sure to feed the size of feed that That's your right. bass need. So bigger bass have a, have bigger requirements. I remember when Dr. Mark Griffin was designing Purina's Aquamax largemouth pellets are, you know, about as big yep. as the end of your thumb. His theory was that a bass will strike seven times and right. then be done. So he, you know, which I don't know how you prove that, but I bought into it, you know. Oh. And if that's the case, and you and a bass can strike seven times and get all the all the nugget right. that it needs in dry weight, that's that's good stuff. Okay, let's see. Um, here's a question I've never heard asked. Uh, Frank James also says, "Do tiger males get better than the Florida male? Or get bigger than the Florida male?" You know, it's, it's hard to give a definite on any of those. You know, we've seen some six and seven pound males, both uh, Florida's and F1's, but it, it's hard for me to give an answer that says, yes, definitely do. We've seen large males in both sizes. I don't see anything that would restrict a tiger bass from getting to the same size as, as a Florida male. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry I don't have an exact answer on that one. All right, here's Tory Rhodes from Lakeland, Tennessee. He says, um, how often should you do a, a, a follow-up stocking of tiger bass to keep the hybrid bigger going? So in other words, you stock a pond with F1 tiger bass, and then you let them grow up. Should you, and if so, if you should, when and how many bass should you add later on down the road to be sure that you're keeping your hybrid bigger up? So I tell you what, do this. Talk talk about what happens if the uh, integrate crosses 
reproduce with each other and the reason to stock more F1 Tiger sure. Bass down the road. So one of the concerns some folks have about um, any type of hybrid is that as you cross hybrids, they wonder about genetic drift. You know, are you going to end up with a whole lot of northern um, leaning bass and a whole lot of Florida leaning bass? And I haven't seen that those fish are less productive than a, you know, any common or, you know, pure strain Florida, pure strain uh, Northern. But what we do know is that the first generation, that F1, does uh, show hybrid vigor. And so we know that fish will outperform the second year. But we've seen plenty of second year fish that perform, you know, still two, three pounds a year. So I don't think it's an issue that you're getting a poor, you know, the integrate crossing really gives you a poor fish. But if you're looking to maximize, then you always want the best. So if you stock your pond the first time, within that three to five year mark, I think if your goal is to have the biggest bass, the most big bass out there that are extremely aggressive, if your harvest and forage program can handle it, I don't see why you couldn't do it every year so that you have a maximum, a, a good year class every year. And we've got some good examples of that happening. Uh, we've been working with the state of Virginia, stocking several of their lakes up there in which either through <clears throat> marking the fish with um, OTC, which uh, will mark their otoliths, they capture the fish the next year, they can put it under a microscope and they can tell the fish for hatchery. Or if what, what what's OTC? Tell it's everybody what OTC means. Uh, and it's I, I don't know who figured out that the otolith, which is a small bone in the ear of a fish, will actually absorb and hold this, but they did. So it's a method of it's only there to mark so that you can track these fish. Uh it's without yeah, killing absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, you know, um, we did. You can Kevin see Brig, back go, go, the F ones that we're stocking. You know, they've seen over fifty percent of their capture studies the next spring are our bass in these giant reservoirs, and so that F one is just taking off. And you're putting that's your year class every year, you know, or that's the the top of your year class. So as long as you're your harvest and your culling and your forage program can handle it. I think it can be done every year. Uh, and what we typically like to do is 52 inch bass per acre. And that gives enough in there uh, without overcrowding. You know, you will have you know, some that don't make it to the next year. Uh, you just have to remember, you got to pull that, you know, a lot more fish out that next year when you're electrofishing or you're harvesting through a uh, hook and line. So uh, it just depends on how intensely you want to manage it. But I, I think putting in that F1 as often as your plan and your budget can, can do, I, I think is a good way to go. All right. I want to stay with that a minute. Kevin Briggs asked probably the most obvious question. He says, uh, I saw the video yesterday talking about adding two-inch bass to a four- or five-year-old pond. How do you add small ones or fish that small? And they well, fly? every fish that's in that lake that was reproduced in that lake started out as an egg, went to a fry, which is that big, and then became a bigger fish. So as long as these, when you release the fish into the lake, they have somewhere they can go hide quickly, um, then plenty survive. And that's what people forget. You have reproduction every year in the, in the pond. And it doesn't all. So that's right. If they can go hide, uh, then if you have structure nearby, then you're good to go. Now I'm going to add a little different yep. spin to that because I'm looking at it through a little, little different eyes. Let's say that we stock uh, stock that 50 per acre. 90 percent of them get eaten. Holy cow! That means we had what five of them survive. And if those five grow up and add into that population five per acre, that's pretty significant right. survival. So even even if 90% get eaten, you've still managed to recruit enough fish into that system that you stand a pretty good shot at keeping 
you're having right. vigor going. <laughs> Let's see here. Bill Cody from the Pond Boss Forum says, discuss how big pellet-fed bass will grow if their diet is primarily good quality high-protein pellets. What's your experience with that? The biggest I've seen on pure pellets is two and a half pounds. You know, but that's in an aquaculture setting. I mean, that was the goal. Uh, and how old is that? How old is that fish? It's about a two-year-old fish, you know. Okay, so in an aquaculture setting, your goal is not to grow giant fish. Your goal is to is to be able to make payroll, pay the feed bill, you know, cover the pumping uh, uh, costs, pay for insurance, yeah. overhead. So you, the, longer you, the longer you sit on a fish, it ain't getting there. My experience has been... The majority, one of the things I'm real so excited about what you guys are doing is the majority of the pellet raised bass in the United States are northern bass. You know, the Theop Inslee and his boys started the feed train craze back in the early 1980s. They're the first ones to do that. And the biggest bass I have seen so far traditionally has been northern bass, and eight pounds is really knocking on the door of giant for feed train largemouth bass. You know, now, one little caveat here that Bill may not know is that when we're stocking tiger bass into ponds, we don't really want them to be totally dependent on fish food. We want them to be enhanced by fish food, but we're also trying to provide a food. Absolutely. Table, right? You know, that's dessert, in my opinion, you know. Yeah. Bill's follow-up question is, dis discuss safe numbers and carrying capacity for largemouth bass on feed. In aerated ponds and air unaerated ponds, you know, you can just tackle that one any way you want to. <laughs> it, you know, like we discussed, uh, and we're feeding extremely heavily on the farm. So, it, so is this it? Now, you, 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 you can exchange water, you can aerate if you want, but. For, for like John Q. Public Pond Owner, what do you think is carrying capacity for a pond for, of largemouth bass? I think you can push 100 pounds to the acre, you know. Um, and see, and I think you can push you 250. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. I mean, you got to work at it. you got to work with your water. I mean, I've got several lakes right now where I promise you there's 250 pounds of bass per acre. Here's the problem with that is nature abhors a vacuum and they abhor a bounty so when you're when your pond really starts kicking that carrying capacity up you're inviting predators you know you're inviting alligators cormorants you're inviting uh Ot um otter <laughs> yeah. you know and so you gotta you even though you can do that you gotta keep your water healthy you gotta you're gonna have to supplement your forage fish because they will Absolutely. overeat your forage fish and you got to have a culling program because they don't all perform like what you Well, and what we see over here in Alabama, and we've had a lot more this year uh, than we have the last few years, are turnover events. You know, when you're pushing that kind of weight, and your water is so green that you can only see three inches in. Even with aeration, we've seen ponds turn over. And so, yep. to me, it's really not, you know, I think you got to balance it between, you know, your fishing activity and what you're really after, you know, make sure that the goals, you know, that 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 aligns with your goal when you're putting up the necessary requirements to to keep your pond alive. Because that's the biggest issue, in my opinion. Is once you have that, yeah, yeah, man, when over happy uh, water, you know, you're not going to save many. So that, yeah, yeah, you know what? If you're trying to push over a hundred pounds per acre, you better be. Yes. I mean, that's a feedlot. Yeah. <laughs> In essence, so you've got to be managing your water. Let's push through some more of these questions. Let's see here. Um, one thing that comes up pretty often, Bill Cody's asking this. He says, discuss ap special applications like using all female largemouth bass, and how do you do that? What do you think about stocking a lake with all female F1 tiger bass or even Florida bass? I think, well, I think the best way to do it is to have Florida's F1s and Northern's so that you're getting a little bit of everything, you know. So we've done a few, and, you know, the jury's still out. You know, people have been doing female bass ponds for a while, but I don't think I don't think it's returned the, you know, it's the silver bullet that a lot of people thought it would, that you would have nothing but giant bass. They would grow. They'd never stop growing because there was so much food in there. 
But almost everyone we've seen, they get locked up at a certain size. We had a customer down the road decided he wanted to drain it all female bass lake and to do structure, you know, re rehab the whole lake. Luckily, uh, he could drain it down to a basin and we actually sang the lake. We pulled out about 32 female bass and pulling them out of the pond, you would have thought they were 13 or 14 pounds because they were so fat, the fattest fish I've ever seen. They were all within a half pound of each other, nine and a half pounds, you know, unlimited wow. forage, but they were identical, you know, and I think one of the things that you have to watch to make sure you're successful with a female bass lake is stocking few females every year because bass don't get big just because they like to get big. They do it so they don't get eaten, so that they have uh, preference during reproduction. So once you take out reproduction, once they get to a certain size, if nobody's competing for food with them, they know they're not going to eat uh, they're not going to push it. It's not worth it to them. So if you're going to use it, it's not simply, I'm going to go throw some females in there and I'm done. Granted, it makes it easier not having to harvest it. But, um, it's, it's not as simple as a lot of people think. I like the idea. I like playing with it, but I think there's still, the jury's still out on exactly the manage uh, an all female league. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm right there with you. I think it's against God's law. God's law is bass. Uh, I think it may be in the book of Bob. Bass That's right. shall reproduce. That's what they're supposed to do. You know, which is one of the biggest headaches that pond managers have because then you got to go right. catch a bunch of bass. You know, it's a pain in the neck to do that. But the all-female lakes I've seen, you know, once a bass gets to be four pounds, it turns into a four-pound bass. And that's right. how they bite. You know, so I've, I've watched catch rates plummet in some of these all-female lakes. Even though you're standing crop, maybe 100 right. pounds per acre, you can't catch right. the gum fish. You know, so they're a little bit of a pain in the neck. Let's go to another question here. It says, uh, let's see here. How long and under what conditions will tiger bass stay feed trained? We don't really need to tackle that. Are tigers less susceptible to cold temperatures than oh, absolutely. here in Florida? Absolutely. We've stocked, I think the – uh, no, uh, I've personally been 50 miles outside of Washington, D.C. with tiger bass. You know, there's no way Floridas are going to go that far. You know, they're just not going to do it. No. So we've gone, um, we've got fish in Indiana, Illinois. We've gone a lot of places, and they definitely outperform the, the Florida bass. You know, Florida bass aren't built to put a lot of fat on before the winter. And so they don't have that kind of hibernating mechanism built in. You know, when you see a, a really fat northern bass and you fillet it, it's going to have a lot more fatty tissue than a Florida bass of the same size. They're just built different because they know yeah, it's going to be cold for six months and, you know, feeding is down and they got to have that air. So uh, tiger bass definitely do better in Florida's. I, I, I can see that. And, you know, another thing that I've learned is that is that when you get into Illinois, Iowa, and you get north of the Mason-Dixon line, they do have this thing called winter, but they've also got this thing called ice. I mean, you and I, when we think about ice, it's in a glass of sweet tea, right? <laughs> that ice insulates those frigid temperatures that sometimes folks along the lower Midwest or, and central part of the United States, you know, when the pond doesn't freeze, and the water temperature drops fast. That, to me, that's what makes those Florida bass more susceptible is how quick the right. temperature drops. But under the ice, it doesn't do that so much. Let's see here. How does tiger bass lifespans compare with Florida bass? You know, that's really more of a habitat and weather. You know, I think, you know, we've seen some, we've tracked some for 10 years. So I know we've got 10-year-old tiger bass, but... Typically, you know, uh, average bass in the southeast, I believe they claim is 11, 11 years is about the max you're going to get. So I can't say they're better or worse than Florida's. I think it's more of a environmental uh, calls than anything, you know. Okay, so all things being equal in Montgomery, Alabama, Florida bass might live to be 10 to 12 years old. 
a northern might make it six to eight, and F one is going to be right up in there in that yes. 10, 11 year year span. You think? Okay. All right. Let's see here. Um, Eric West is asking about catchability. Well, we've already kind of tackled that a little bit, but one of the reasons that Barry and Don started working with that integrated cross was because of catchability. Because I remember they were talking to them way back in the 80s. I remember when they started. Now, we had some really fun conversations. One of the problems was people with Florida bass just couldn't catch their fish. People with northerns could. And so you might have northerns and Floridas, but you can't catch the Floridas, even though they're bigger and the northerns are wearing you out. So the F1 cross, which is an integrated cross, was it was the best of both worlds. So let's say here, uh, Jay, Justin Ludwig asks this from the Palm Box Forum. He says, what are the preferred food choices if prevent, presented with abundant natural forage and fish food? So in other words, what he's asking is, do what do you think that a, a, that a population F1 tiger bass in somebody's pond that's got abundant forage, what, are they going to prefer anything? Well, Prefer pellets compared to food? Uh, they're going to prefer the, the steak over the salad, I think, every time. You know, if you had a bluegill swimming by, you know, you know, well, if the bluegill sitting still just like that pellet is, he's going to take the bluegill, in my opinion. You know, what we see here is that you've got to have a strong bluegill population in your lake because that's the mainstay of, of bass in our southeastern lakes. But shad, they – absolutely love threadfin shad and part of that is you know they can push them in school and they go under them and open their mouth and then inhale five of them at a time you know which makes for great fishing you know off of those schools and the shad will really put the extra weight on them uh but we like bluegill being the base and then you come on top uh but i definitely would say bluegill and shad uh over here in alabama are going to be their preferred every time i would concur with that and, and to kind of dovetail in with what you say you know if you've got a feeder and you're feeding your bass and they're coming to the feed and say you're feeding them four times a day and that feeder goes off for 10 seconds let me do the math let's see and let's say they feed for a minute there's four <laughs> minutes a day that they're eating at a feeder and that leaves uh 23 hours and 56 minutes that they're not you know that they're out actually trying to make an honest living eating other fish which that's what right. they prefer anyway. All right, I'm going to tackle some questions here uh, tonight. Let's see. Um, Kevin Smith says the question he's got is, he's got a one-acre pond full of forage. What kind of growth rate can you expect? And he's feeding Aquamax MVP twice a day. So what growth rate should you expect from newly stocked, you know, small F1 Tiger bass in a brand-new pond like that? What would he expect? I really expect him to see uh, plenty uh, two-pounders next year. You know, we've seen a handful of cases of three pounds that first year. But all your fish are going to, almost all, um, all your bass should be a pound within a year. You're going to see a lot of twos. And hopefully in a place where you're really pushing it, like it sounds like he is, he should have some threes in that first year. And, you know, we've seen a couple of ponds with, you know, four-year-old bass are 11 pounds. You know, it's just the right conditions. Uh, so they can really – really push it so but you've also seen some four-year-old ponds where some of those same bass are three quarters of a pound because they're boys right. and they don't care That's right right yep okay so there there's your variation okay so now chad donaldson is asking here on tonight's show he says i'm building a pond near a creek sometimes the creek floods do you think the largemouth bass will hunker down for the two to four days of flooding or will they spill all over and run away uh, most of the time and we deal with that in a lot of places you don't lose all your fish. Um, some will go, uh, but it, you're not going to lose everything. You know, we've never. If you, yeah, my experience is if you've got excellent structure and great food, why in the world would you want to swim right. out into a field? You know, so my experience, I've, I've seen dams burst knowing confidently that all the fish left and then come back in and bring my electric fishing boat, launch it on a, on a series of dead gum pieces of plywood going down into the puddle that's left and shocked up 300 bass that range in size from two pounds to 10 pounds that's right. that didn't leave because they didn't want to. They in our production ponds, we drain them every, you know, after every uh, class and it's six inch pipe in the end of a one and a half acre pond. And we don't, we don't need to screen it. 
almost every fish will stay in that pond down to the last puddle to get out the remainder. We don't see very many. You know, grass carp are about the only thing that will take a chance to leave if there's running water. Your grass carp will leave, but everything yep. they put. Yep. And, yeah, and, and, and young of the year baby fish that are living in shallow water anyway, some of those will migrate, like little bitty bass, little bitty bluegill, but the big mature fish, their tendency isn't. Christopher Aguilar has got a question. He says, man, half my new babies died upon delivering my pond. Water from the delivery truck was ice cold versus the hot, humid conditions here. Tried to add pond water to the bags, but no hope. So just, uh, I mean, yeah. you've been through this. What, what, okay, so he gets a bag of fish in really cold water to go stock into a hot pond. What's uh, the problem? It's just too much shock. And probably what happened is as he started to add the pond water to the bag, there wasn't enough oxygen to keep the fish alive. You know, when people ship fish like that, they pump pure oxygen into those bags. So as soon as you open it, you're going to lose a lot of oxygen. Then you put hot water out of your pond that's, you know, doesn't have, it's not pure oxygen by any stretch. And so you keep adding it, they're getting hotter, they're breathing faster, and probably more, more low oxygen than a temperature shock, you know. Uh, so what he should have done was leave the oxygen in the bag, let the bag float for 15 or 20 minutes or half an whatever. hour, an hour in the pond and let the temperature Absolutely. slowly rise. That's one of the, that's one of the pitfalls. You, and when you buy fish, you really want to be within about five or six degrees of the water from the truck with the water in the pond before you stock those fish. Okay, let's see. Here's one from uh, Mr. Smith. He says, how did last winter affect your thread fin shad? Do you have any thread fin available now? What's going on with thread fin shad, brother? What McNulty? shad? Um, you know, we raise probably, <laughs> I don't know, 40 acres of shad every year. And I think in the 40 acres, we were able to catch 100 pounds to redistribute over those acres. So uh, we did have some of the big ones survive the winter, uh, and they have reproduced already. And we've got about inch, inch and a half shad now. Uh, we're going to try to move them in July, but shad are hard to move in April, much less July at these temperatures. And they're all going to be just two inches long. So it's going to be, you know, we're, we're going to do our best and see how they do next month. Got it. So uh, you're waiting for them to get to a certain size because you know if you try to move the little babies now, that's right. Too you hard look to handle. at start dying at right. an inch and a half. Here's a great question from Leo Wynn from out on the, he lives out on the West Coast in California. Very thoughtful guy. I mean, this guy is brilliant. He has some outstanding questions. He says, is there an observable aggressive behavior transfer to newer generations as tiger bass are blended with the existing mixture of largemouth bass? So in other words, when you stock tiger bass into an existing bass fishery and they begin to reproduce, can you see any change in behavior of those offspring and those FX crosses? Yes. You know, and I think a lot of that, I don't think it's necessarily because of the tiger bass. Anytime you put a good new strain of bass, you know, I've seen where people have put northern bass in a pond just to get the bite going. And what actually happened is the other fish were then had to be more competitive to get their food. So it's really, you're just kicking up the competition. You know, the tiger bass being more aggressive, I think it works better. But I don't think that's necessarily just because it's a tiger bass. I think it's a new new fish new environment, and they're two inches. They're going to get eaten if they don't become six inches quick. Gotcha. Looks like Terry Camp checked in. Terry is saying, stock my pond. <laughs> Matt Rail, hey, our good mutual friend Matt Rail is checking in with us. He's watching what's going on. John Wilson from Aquadoc up in Ohio. You I do know, not. John? John, John is an outstanding uh, pond management guy, and he's got – a great business up there in, in the Cleveland, Ohio area. He loves baseball, so he's usually watching this while he's watching his Cleveland Indians play baseball. Okay, Jacob West is asking. Jacob is from not – he's real close to where we are here in North Texas. He just says, as aggressive as Tiger Bass are, how do you stock more in the future without them becoming the snack? Okay, we've kind of tackled that. You know, so really, I mean, how do you pick the number? Is 50 enough? Is 500 enough? Is 10 enough? How many is enough to replenish that, to recruit the next next year class? How many is enough? You know, I, I think 50 is a good starting point, but just like any system, my three acre is so much different than your three acre that you just have to watch it. Are you getting the results you want with 50? 
you know, did you way overpopulate your lake? So next time you go down or you didn't see much of an effect on anything. So you, you go higher. So it's 50 is 50 is a number that there has been some research done that shows at 50 to the acre, two years in a row, you can go in there and see those fish survived and contributed to the population. So that, that's our base. So that's just, a, that. so, okay, I got it. So in other words, the, the, the answer to that is every pond is different. And based on your management strategy, that helps determine the numbers of fish that you should stock if you want to keep recruiting for that, uh, that aggressive nature and that hybrid vigor for those fish. So in other words, if you stock a pond and then you come in and you're not harvesting any bass at all and you let your bass get crowded for the food chain, then stocking more tiger bass isn't going to be an answer. So if you've got the right habitat, you've got good food chain, your genetics, what you're thinking about, and you've got a good harvest plan, then stocking 50 to the acre has been proven scientifically right. that it will work. Right? Okay. Uh, Matt Rail says, you are awesome. <laughs> hey, so, so is he, right? All right, let's see. So here comes Kevin Smith again. Looks like Beth LaHaye, our associate editor, has checked in. Good to see her. Uh, Kevin Smith says, I stocked 122-inch tiger bass in a one-acre fertilized pond in Zachary, Louisiana, two weeks ago. The forage was 1,000 copper nose, 200 red ears, 15 pounds of fat and minnows stocked in March. Forage is everywhere now. I also feed Aquamax twice a day. What kind of growth rate should he expect from his 122-inch bass in a one-acre pond in Zachary, Louisiana? Well, you know, we, we kind of touched on that, but I think that first year, I, I, there's not enough bass in there to where they're competing as far as carrying capacity or anything. So I know you've been doing a lot of work where you have high number of bass and then you start calling the males out. So, you know, that first year he'll be fine, but he needs to really start looking if he wants to push the growth, follow the plan that you've been using and, you know, really focusing on calling out. Uh, the yeah, there you go. What we've done, what we've done is we know that I got that 120 bass there, Kevin, half are girls. Those are going to be the fish that get bigger, you know. You can ask this guy right here. He'll tell you. The, and, and about 30, 20 to 30 percent of the girls are going to be the most aggressive, fastest growing fish with the best destiny in, in your body of water, you know. So you need to watch their growth rates. And when you start seeing fish after year two or year three that really aren't performing, and once these fish begin to reproduce, that's when you know you need to start culling some. Mark Dauber from Montgomery, Alabama. Says, how do you tell the difference between a tiger and a Florida? Can you look at a Florida and a tiger bass and tell the difference? Sometimes you can see the difference, but to me, to be uh, comfortable, genetic testing is the only way to do it. You know, a lot of times the northern bass have kind of a grayer color, and sometimes the Florida have, you know, some really deep, dark stripes. But I've seen these bass change colors coming from a pond and putting them in a tank, you know, so I'm not comfortable saying hey and i see a lot of bass that this is florida and that's not so I, I think you really have to you know trust your hatchery and then follow up with genetic testing yeah that's good and if you don't want to pay for genetic testing stock more known right. genetics that's a pretty good move so i'm going to say hello to dennis back cheese my son-in-law rick perkins Dion myers Let's see here. Mark Hibden, good to see him from Newcastle, Oklahoma, near outside of Oklahoma City. Dusty Allen, Dion Myers. Let's see. Um, Christopher Aguilar is asking, what's the best, most efficient water testing method? I'll tell you what we do. We send a sample in for 25 bucks to the Texas A&M Soil Sciences Lab and have, us email, have them email the uh, results to us. And if you don't know how to read the water test results, come to, come to me. I'll help you do that. And... Be, and be, be happy to do that. Christopher Aguilar is asking, will the tiger bass and other large Absolutely. mouth cross? Terry, Tori Rhodes is asking, how do you choose the aggressive northern bass to make the cross? So in other words, you guys at, at, at American Sport Fish have spent 25 plus years selectively culling fish. So just without giving away any trade secrets, tell the folks what you guys go through. You know, through a lot of it is... Um, Especially, we'll take some cannibals. I think y'all call them jumpers out there in Texas. You know, when you yeah, have that first year <laughs> class and you harvest the pond, and 99.9% .9 of them were two inches, 
and then you have three that are already six inches because they've eaten every bass that's gone through there. That part uh, yep. that we kind of use to to bring in uh, new genetics. And the other is just watching growth rates and feeding behavior. You know, we have these fish, when we spawn our bass, we bring them up into tanks early in the winter, and we have to keep them fed and fat for their eggs. And so you can really check out the bass. You can tell the difference in, in what's going on between the different fish and overall growth, you know, that, which is also a determination. Hey, folks, if you like what you're hearing, subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. 35 bucks a year. Go to pondboss.com or info at pondboss.com. Tell us you want to subscribe. We've got an online store at pondboss.com. And all these videos, I mean, th this is what fuels the economy that allows us to do what we're doing right here for you guys so you can meet folks like Sean. So subscribe to Pond Boss. Matt Rail, hey, there's David Ricks. He's from Ohio. We're going to be seeing him at Kingfisher Society in November. Matt Rail says, well, the northern bass outcompete a TB long-term tiger bass because it can spawn earlier in the north? Will it outcompete because it can reproduce, because it tends to reproduce earlier than tiger bass may? You know, I think once it's in that environment, I don't know if you're going to see a drastic change in the same pond, but we definitely see when we – and we actually start a month earlier than the natural season by getting uh, warm well water, that our bass, our two-inch bass, are almost always the head of the year class. They're bigger than what's spawning in there naturally. You know, even in a fertilized pond, it's not nearly as fertile as our production ponds in which we're putting cottonseed meal in three times a week and everything else. So uh, there's a lot to it. I can't tell Matt whether or not if you had a tiger bass and a northern bass in his pond up there, if you would see that big change, I, I don't know. Or fun. I got it. Hey, Matt, listen to this. If there are some male tiger bass, <laughs> just like you and I, they're ready to go. You know, so if there's a northern bass female and a tiger bass male, yep. they will reproduce. They're going to be ready. Let's see. Robbie May. I've met him once or twice. Robbie says, what are your thoughts on gizzard shed as a forage for the bass? Is it best in trophy situations only? Well, he knows my opinion. That's that's my partner. I don't know if he's trying to <laughs> throw me a hard one. I think he's really asking you what you think. You know, we stick uh, – I actually don't have gizzard shed on my farm. We don't raise them. We, uh, and a lot of that was because keeping them separated, it, it became too difficult. So we have one thread fin do well. So – you do a lot of trophy bass ponds. So what's your opinion on gizzard shed? <laughs> I like that diversion. That's good. Absolutely. Always. I always have gizzard shad in every trophy bass lake. Now, here's the caveat. I don't allow gizzard shad to be stocked in any of my trophy bass lakes until I'm confident that at least 25% of the mass of bass in that lake exceeds three pounds because i don't want gizzard shad growing too fast getting too big where they can't be used you know it's 728 we got a few more questions uh leanne wanted me to remind everybody that she's got a, a promotion going on if you want a pond boss fishing shirt she's going to take orders uh, through this friday they're a little high but it's a pond boss shirt 50 bucks for magellan shirts different colors Info at pondboss.com if you're looking for a shirt because we buy them, get them shipped here, take them to get them embroidered, and then ship them to you. So that includes all that. So if you guys want a shirt, let us know. Okay, so Kevin Smith says, so did I overstock by stocking 120 per acre? No, you did not. You did not overstock. Leo's follow-up question. You have true northern and Florida cross as a tiger. How many generations of crossing between tiger to unknown existing F1s before it's no longer considered as a tiger bass, assuming the tiger population uh, got removed? So what, what he's asking is what is right. a tiger and, bass? And, you know, typically we refer to it as the F1, that, that first generation. Because to, to me, what people expect out of a tiger bass, it's that first generation with the hybrid vigor. So – you know, you're getting across, and we've seen a pond where it was eight years old. We stocked the tiger bass, and we took him, took fin clips to Eric Peeman at Auburn University, and he studied it. And 75, it was like, it was a bell curve, basically. 
most of the fish were still right there at the, you know, 45 and 55 northern Florida mix, but you had some outliers. So whether or not you're going to call that a tiger bass or uh, integrate or an FX, you know, I think it's kind of semantics, but uh, they do stay close. A majority of the fish stay very close to that 50-50. It varies, obviously. It's When you test a F1, it is perfectly 50-50, you know, and so those next ones, there is drift, but after eight years, you see that still 75% are right there in that in that 50-50-ish range. There you go. Great answer. All right, so now Nick Whitfield says, hey, Sean, what's your thoughts on soft-shell turtles that eating my fish and hurting my pond? Nick, is that Nick a work. question? Here, I, you know, I'm going to answer this one. If a soft-shell turtle eats a fish, the fish deserved it. They're not uh, not impacting your pond. Matt Rail asks, how did Tiger Bass get its name? That's a pretty well, cool question. Well, you know, I got a different story every time I ask Don and Barry. But, you know, they're both Auburn grads, which are Tigers. Uh, but really, they were looking for something to demonstrate the aggressiveness of the fish. And we all know Tigers are aggressive. So I think there's a couple different things and probably depends on when you ask Don or Barry you know, what day they decided on Tiger Bass, which door you get. So it, it's basically to, you know, just demonstrate that it is a very aggressive fish. Excellent. Hey, listen, Sean, man, I'm so thrilled that you joined us tonight. This is one of the best shows we've had. And uh, tell the folks how to find you. What's the best way to get uh, in touch with you? Can you can call us at, uh, at the office. It's 334-281-7703. Uh, nowadays, though, the web is usually the easiest, you know, um, americansportfish.com or my email is simply sean at americansportfish.com S-H-A-W-N yeah S-H-A-W-N hey, hey folks thanks for joining us and don't forget Bob Lusk Outdoors helps manage lakes and ponds Pond Boss Magazine is the go to here it is 35 bucks a year subscribe and thanks for tuning in tonight we will catch you next Wednesday live 6.30 to 7.30 from I don't know where, and I don't know who's going to be on, but we're going to do something fun. Uh, Good night, everybody. Thanks, thanks again, Sean. Bye. Adios.